tonight we're going to discover uh, the tremendous weapon system that God has put at our disposal. As we turn to that page in the manual, I want to turn to a verse in the Old Testament in Jeremiah, the 50th chapter and verse 25. Jeremiah 50 and verse 25. Page 55 in the manual. And page 751 in the Bible. Ready reference, quick built-in reference system there. Jeremiah 50, verse 25. The Lord has opened his armory. God has an armory. It is not shut this evening. It is open. And in there, there are spiritual hand grenades. There are anti-tank guns. There are bazookas. There are M16s. There are Sten guns, Bren guns, all types of guns and offensive weapons. Offensive. Defensive, yes, but offensive. I'm not sure if you'll recall in Ephesians 6, particularly verse 17, where it says about the sword of the Spirit being the Word of God, that the Word of God is the sword that the Spirit uses. You will notice that all that armor is attack armor. There is no covering for the back whatsoever the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the loins girt about with truth, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith. Above everything, above all, take the shield of faith and the sword that the Spirit uses, which is the Word of God, and use that. And they are all offensive attack weapons. They are for the defense of the soldier as he goes into attack. He has nothing for his back, his only real attack weapon is the Word of God. On this occasion that we see here, he has defense upon him as he goes uh, into battle and into the war. So firstly tonight, we learn from this verse that God, A, has an armory, that B, the armory is open, and as a result of that, if you and I are weak and dull and boring and ineffective in our Christian witness and our Christian ministry, in our Christian life, it is not because of God. It is not God's fault. For he has an armory. And the armory contains the weapon system. Notice this. He has brought forth the weapons of his indignation. He expects you and I to know what those weapons are. He expects you and I to take a hold of those weapons and get out on the testing range and begin to experiment with those weapons so that we can have confidence in the weapons that God has made at our disposal. There may be something we'll become more proficient in the use. But that comes with practice and that comes with using and familiarity with that particular weapon. So God has an armory. Uh, on the way over here to the New Testament, I'd like to give you another verse because uh, we jumped through that last night from Nehemiah 3. But in Nehemiah 3, uh, you will find that it talks about the restoration of the various gates. There are ten that are mentioned here. There are two and other sections of Nehemiah that come later. One in, I believe it's chapter 8, and another in, in uh, 10. But you will notice that in all those various gates, they speak of various experiences that you and I are to have incorporated into our Christian uh, lives. Now you'll notice also in verse 16, after him repaired Nehemiah, the son of Azbuk, the ruler of half part of Bethsur, under the place over against the sepulchres of David, and unto the pool that was made, unto the house of the mighty. Now we talked about the mighty men this morning, and there was a specific area where they lived in Jerusalem. It refers here to them in the house of the mighty, and in verse 19, in this context, it says, the next to him repaired Ezra, the son of Jeshua, the ruler of Mizpah, another piece over against the going up to the armory at the turning of the wall. Did you get that? The mighty men lived by the armory. If war was going to break out, it was no time to say, Oh God, what am I going to do? I have to rush over to the armory and draw some weapons. No time to think about that. You live next door to the, to the armory. You know where those weapons are. And as soon as war has been declared or the, uh, an enemy moves against you, and then you can move and apply those weapons and straight in there, way ahead of everything else. 
because you live in that association uh, with the mighty men that live uh, close to the armory at the house at the time of the turning of the wall. On page 55 then in the manual, it refers to a New Testament group of scriptures. There are three of them here, and we will turn to that. 2 Corinthians 10, it was quoted last evening, but I want to turn to it again here tonight. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3, 4, and 5. The Bible says, though we are in the flesh, we are human beings, we have a physical body, a, ma a material, physical body, even though that we are in a physical body, our warfare is not after the flesh. We need to understand that oftentimes eruptions uh, that take place within our lives with other personal relationships are inspired by the devil. They're inspired by satanic spirits that are to agitate and stir and stimulate that circumstance. We're not dealing with flesh and blood. We are dealing with a common foe. The enemy is not our Christian brother and sister. It is the working of the adversary that will cause this thing. We need to be well aware to that. We are not ignorant of his devices, the Bible says. And I find many Christians that are ignorant of his devices and think they're fighting their brother and sister or uh, the youth leader or <laughs> somebody else that's in the church, whatever your persuasion may be. But you'll notice now in verse 4, the weapons of your warfare and my warfare are weapons that are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of the strongholds uh, here of Satan. Verse 5, we are to cast down imaginations. See where the battle's going to take place? In the realm of the mind, in the imagination. Now the imagination is a faculty of the human spirit. It can be used for the power of good. You remember in Genesis 10 that when the people decided at the Tower of Babel that they were going to be united uh, to build this tower, God said, and God's testimony of them was, nothing will be withheld from them that they have imagined to do. Don't ever put the mind down and say that's just carnal. Whatever, we need to understand uh, what is taking place here. To cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the name of God and we are to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. See where the battleground's going to be? The flesh lusts against the spirit. The spirit lusts against the flesh. And thou canst not do uh, the thing that we desire to do. The big problem that Paul had in Romans 7 was I. His eye problem. Need to see an eye specialist. Anyway, uh, he was uh, to get something done about that some 32 or 36 times the word uh, I appears. Who shall deliver me? And it sounds like it's a hopeless case. It actually says there, I thank God through my Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us the answer. He knows. And so, do you? Uh, but so here we find that God is saying that we are to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And when I was preparing these notes, I never put the word of God uh, in here as an offensive attack weapon because I used to say that goes without saying. But I have learned in life that a lot of things that go without saying need to be said. <laughs> and it's more reason than enough that they need to be said and need to be emphasized. So the Word of God, of course, I'm sure you will agree this evening that the Word of God uh, is a very, very powerful attack weapon. We know, for instance, in Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. See, the Word of God is symbolized and spoken uh, as a sword. In Revelation 1, you have a picture of the Lord Jesus as he appears in the church in 1984. And he's got a sword coming out of his mouth. It speaks of the word of God that comes from his mouth. In Revelation 19, where we were again this morning, there's a sword coming out of the mouth of that one that sits upon the horse. See, that's symbology. That's uh, typical. It indicates uh, a truth that is to be revealed. And that is speaking here of the word of God. You see, in John 6 and verse 63, very interesting verse, uh, when the disciples began to go back and walk no more with the, with the Lord, the Lord said, Are you going to leave me also? And Peter said, No, Lord, because thou hast the words of eternal life. And then Jesus said something that was very similar again to Matthew 18 that we looked at also last evening about that revelation that came forth uh, when he said uh, that the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. 
Now listen to that very closely. The words that I speak, he said in John 6 and verse 63, the flesh profits nothing. What does the flesh profit? Nothing. Don't say it means something, it means nothing. The flesh profits... I'm talking about revelation here. I'm not talking about flesh. We all just come here. I've been to some meetings and say, sorry, I can't be with you tonight, Pastor, but I'll be there with you in spirit. I said, good. I'll be looking for you. <laughs> when I see him next time, I said, I was looking on that third light bulb on the second chandelier that was hanging just over on the left-hand side when you come in. I look for you up on the fan. I look for you all over the place, up there in the balcony. I was looking everywhere and I couldn't see your spirit. I'm so glad you didn't just sit at home tonight and come in spirit. We'd all be floating all around this room and having the time of our life and uh, it'd be a lonely place if I was the only one that turned up in the flesh and you were all here in spirit and I'd be muttering away here and talking away and we'd be floating all around the place and around all the lights. Hey, it's a good thing to know that we've got a, a human body and that spirit lives in the body. And while it's good to say I'm with you in spirit, and I look for him and don't see him. I said, where's your body? They said, oh, it's down on the beach, hanging ten, hanging five, you know, doing the business. I said, bring it, bring your spirit. Don't send your spirit to church and put your body on the surfboard. Bring your body and your spirit to God's house. And it's better that way because then we all, you know, it's all happily. It's just a more of a natural thing. Really, really, that's the way it should be. Concerning revelation, he said, The flesh profiteth nothing, but the words that I speak unto thee a spirit. It's like a sword, see? And when that word is energized by the Holy Spirit, there is no profit whatsoever in a word that is not energized by the Holy Spirit. And when the word comes forth, it must be energized by the Holy Spirit. The flesh profits nothing, but the words that I speak unto thee are spirit and their life. You see, when your words, your words are spirit. Your words are things. Your thoughts are things. Come on, we need to understand this. Our thoughts are things. And if we think negatively, we're going to be attracted along to a certain a style. If we think positively, we don't have an accident going somewhere to happen, but you can begin to talk. And when we understand from the words that come from us, they can control our lives. The very words we say. Jesus had uh, much to say uh, concerning that. I was in uh, New South Wales, Australia, just before we came over here some 12 months ago. And there I met a man who was a storekeeper. He sold petrol, had a little wayside uh, petrol station and sold, uh, well, among other things, alcohol. he just become a Christian. And uh, he was quite happy about still selling the alcohol when he gets saved. But he could no longer sell chocolate frogs. <laughs> so I began to ask and I said, why can you no longer sell chocolate frogs? Now let me explain this. I understand when I say a chocolate frog in Canada, that's, a, that's a, a, a natural frog that's covered in chocolate. I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to everything that's chocolate. I wouldn't go those, but I eat the other chocolate frogs. They said, you can't eat chocolate. I said, why not? I mean, those little chocolate frogs are all made of chocolate. The head is chocolate. The little bump there by the tail is chocolate. The back legs are chocolate. The front legs are chocolate. Everything's chocolate, you understand? So he would not eat these things. I said, why not? He says, because in Revelation 16, there are three spirits like frogs. And they come out of the mouth. It's all right to sell alcohol and booze and whiskey and do your whole thing. I mean, that doesn't mean a thing. Go ahead and sell that. But I can't sell frogs. And he wouldn't sell these little snakes. If the snakes are similar to them, I said, give them to me, boy. Eat the heads right off them, these little snakes. Eat the tails, eat the middles, eat anything of them. They eat a lot of them. Best thing you can do with those things if they're the devil, eat the things. <laughs> You know, aren't we sticklers for minor details in some areas and yet the big weightier matters of the law, we just let it go. Jesus said we strain at gnats. Here comes a little that. Strain at the gnat. Won't let it go down. Here comes a camel, big hump and all, and it goes down, doesn't even touch the sides. <gasps> go like that and doesn't even touch the sides. Think of it. We strain at the gnats. We, sh we major minors and we minor majors. We need to major majors and minor minors. Faith is a major. We need to major faith. Women wearing hats is a minor. We need to minor women's hats. I can prove to you that a woman uh, has to have a hat or a covering on her head from the scripture. You can prove that. I can also prove that a woman's hair is a covering and I can prove that a woman's husband's a covering, all from the scripture. 
if that's a, if we want to go on that way. But let me just give you one illustration of a woman's hair as a covering, which I believe it is. If a woman's hair is a covering, it is a shame for a woman to pray or prophesy with a head uncovered. It is also a shame for a man to pray or prophesy with his head covered. Therefore, if a woman's hair is a covering and you're going to project the argument to its logical conclusion, only bald men can prophesy. <laughs> and I think it all depends where the hair is. Lady, if it's an inch and a half long and on the end of your nose, I say, it's too long, get rid of it, cut the thing off and, and get rid of it. It's no good being an inch and a half long and on the end of your nose, it all depends. See, we, we need to, we strain at that. And we're so finicky about things that don't matter. Here comes our tithes, you know, on our little cumin seeds. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's a bent one. That'll be number ten. That's God's. Uh, eight, nine, ten. And here there, the leaf's got a bit of leaf curl on the mint and all this. And we get a little plastic bag and we bring it to church. What about the weightier matters of the law? Love, mercy, and judgment. Not interested in that. Fiddle about with the minors. See what I'm saying? So God is interested in the major. Uh, so many things so the great thing about the word of God of course we don't want to try and explain it to the devil how ridiculous it would be if a burglar was walking through our house and we happened to pull our 38 Smith and Wesson out on him he said now sir I'm going to caution you you persist with this behavior I am going to squeeze this little thing on this gun what I call a trigger and when I do that, it is going to cause a hammer to uh, start to uh, come back and become loaded. And when I press that trigger to a certain point, that hammer is going to strike uh, the cartridge uh, in this particular bullet that is inside the gun, and there will be an explosion. You may or may not hear it before you hit the floor. But uh, uh, when that release has come, it's going to dislodge a certain little piece of lead. And that projectile is going to travel down the barrel, and as it does so, there is what we call rifling in the barrel that is going to twist uh, this lead and give it a true trajectory in its flight. So when I, because you don't have to explain it over about 10 feet anyway, but that projectile is going to go through the air, lodge in your abdomen, and do you know what will happen, sir? It will kill you. So don't make me use it. There are many people running around in the Christian army trying to explain that to the devil. Devil, this is what God said. You've got to listen. We explain. You don't explain the weapon. You just pull the trigger. <laughs> Shoot the blighter. <laughs> just pull the trigger. Was it chariots of fire or something? I don't sort of see much, but I, I remember there was... No, it wasn't. It was... Uh, well, I don't know what it is. Raiders of the Lost Dark. And I happened to have, have seen that a couple of years ago when it first came out. And uh, this man, you remember, when he's coming around there and he comes out, you know, and he pulls out the sword, he's going, <laughs> trying to scare the life out of him. This guy just reaches down, he pulls up, he goes, bang, shoots the guy. <laughs> like that, they're going to have a fight and a confrontation. I thought, what a tremendous illustration. Many of us are running around, <laughs> like this here. And we're trying to show off before the devil when we've got to get down to grips. Just pull the gun out, use the thing. You do not explain the weapon. And some of us are trying to vindicate what we do and apologize for what we do to the devil and to everybody else. It's a weapon system that God has devised and given to us. Secondly, it's mentioned first here on the list, a tremendous weapon that we have, I believe, is a Christian's hydrogen bomb. His cobalt bomb, the neutron bomb, the atomic bomb, nuclear warhead, however you want to say this, is love. Agape. Not filio, or not eros, but agape. The divine love and nature of God. The great thing about the love of God, it is a love by principle. I cannot love that man. Do you mean to say, I will not love that man? Is that what you really mean? I will not love that man? Love, the nature of God, is a love by principle. I do not love because you love me, but it is a love, there is a love that we are to embrace that loves regardless of the circumstances. I will love that person. I know some people are easy to love, like me, and others are not so easy to love, like somebody else. <laughs> But we can ask the Holy Spirit. You know Romans 5, 5, the Bible says, The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that is given unto us. 
And if you find some character difficult, because if we have people that are similar to us in personality and we can relate to them by all means, uh, we find that easy to love. But there are some people that require, and everybody's different, God has put this whole thing together of another kind, another type of person. But you see, if we find it difficult like that, then we have to ask the Lord, Lord, I am asking, I do not have the ability and the capacity to love, but I'm asking you that through me, this vessel, you will love people through me. And you will demonstrate your love, and you will do that because I do not have the capacity, and I'm asking that you would do this. When the Bible says that God loved the world, and that uh, when uh, this love is to be a one-way love, and a love that loves and expects nothing in return, this is what is defined by God. God so loved the world, John 3.16, the gospel in a nutshell, that he gave his only begotten son. But what did human beings do with his son? Slew the son. What does the Lord do? Still loves the people. While I was yet a sinner, Romans tells me, Christ died for me. And if Christ died for me, then I think uh, we need to show tolerance uh, to other people uh, that we may find difficult to love when the Bible says that God is love in 1 John 4 and 8 it says God is agape this is what it means a love by principle a fuller definition of the love of God I'm sure you know that already is 1 Corinthians 13 love suffers long and, and uh, whatever it is not a love by emotion it is not a love by feeling I feel I cannot love that man there we have uh, entered the problem I determined that I will love that man even though he is difficult to love and I find it hard to love. The word of God is an offensive weapon. Love is a weapon. If you can't get them any other way, get them by love. Have you ever heard the story of Nicky Cruz? I'm sure you've heard it so many times across the switchblade how that young boy wanted to be initiated into the Mau Mau gang and the gang leader said, if you will stand there, we will pummel you with our fists and hit you so hard all over your body until you lapse into unconsciousness or you can have a second choice we will stand at a certain distance of yardage and throw blades, switch blades at you and if they will lodge in your body and draw blood you can be a member of our gang what do you prefer? he said I'll take the, I'll take the beating you know when Nicky Cruz was in prison and David Wilkinson went to him and told him Nicky Jesus loves you Nicky Cruz spun on him and said, go to hell, preacher, and spat in his face. And when his head hit the pillow on that night, all he could hear, he could not hear another thing, he couldn't think about another thing, the Holy Spirit began to work on him, the Holy Spirit began to move on him, Nicky, Jesus loves you. Nicky, Jesus loves you. And you know as well as I do, after the boy had been released and the psychiatrist tried to work him over and analyze the miracle of the new birth, you cannot analyze the miracle of the new birth. You cannot put God in a test tube. You cannot put God under a microscope. You want to try and analyze God and the miracle of the new birth. They took him to a psychiatrist and the psychiatrist said, I have three questions for you. One, I want you to draw a picture of a tree. So he said, I did. And to keep him happy, I put two little birds in it. <laughs> That's what I'd have done. <laughs> Give them more than what they asked for, see? <laughs> Principle of success. He said, Nicky, I want you to draw a picture of a woman. So he said, I proceeded to draw a picture of a woman, and there was no mistake, that picture was a woman. You could tell it was not a man. The doctor then said, I have this question for you. You're out in the Atlantic with a whole boatload of people. The captain says there's too much weight on the ship. We're going to require one man to jump overboard. And if one man will jump overboard, the whole ship will be saved. He said a certain nationality stood up and began to talk about his nation and said, here's an opportunity to die for my country. And he leapt overboard and the whole boatload of people were saved. A second nationality and a second illustration was used. And that man began to praise his country and said, here I have an opportunity for you uh, to uh, become a great nation and I am willing to die for my country and bring glory to my country and sacrifice my life that these people may live. And he jumped overboard. Then the captain said, Nicky, Puerto Rican, what would you do? He said, I would begin to say Puerto Rico, the island by birth. He'd begin to sing the praises about Puerto Rico and build up this whole thing. And he turned to the psychiatrist and then he said, then do you know what I'd do? 
The psychiatrist said, no, I don't know what you do. What would you do? He said, I'd grab that psychiatrist that's trying to drive me crazy and I'd throw him overboard. <laughs> then the psychiatrist said, if a man walked up to you on the street and you didn't know him and you, he said, I love you, what would you think? He said, I think the man would be homosexual. You'd have to think that. You'd have to think that. But when David Wilkinson said, Nikki, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. There's no way you can try to explain that, try to put it in a test tube. But this is a weapon. It's not a thing you try to explain. It's something that's communicated. It's something that's received. It's something that's felt. It's God. For God is love. And his head hit the pillow and all that night the conviction of the Holy Ghost was upon him. You know, he responded and gave his life to Christ. You know, there's a tremendous verse that's on here on the sheet, John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give unto you. And he said, I want to tell you one thing, that by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, because you all talk in tongues. You know what he said? I'm all for talking in tongues. He said, by this all men shall know that you're my disciples, because you have love one for another. And I believe we're going to have a baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire, but we're going to have a baptism of love. God's going to do that. Love is related to forgiveness. And we either have the capacity to forgive or we just simply say, I, I cannot. Jesus said we're to love our enemies. Paul said, give your enemy food to eat and give him drink to drink. Heap coals of fire upon his head. The third illustration is listed as number two because I'm counting the word of God here, then love. Here's a, a weapon that I'm sure many of you know uh, to be true. The name of Jesus. How many believe the name of Jesus is an offensive weapon? And I learned as a young Christian, I've saved about three weeks. I was into the flying saucer business before I got saved. I was into a lot of things before I got saved because I'm looking for something. And I don't know what I'm looking for. My wife knows what I'm looking for. She used to go to a brethren camp every Christmas and get saved and backslide all year and go back the next year and get saved and backslide all the next year and this went on repeatedly. She knew what I was looking for and she wouldn't tell me because she knew if I got on the ball, she'd have to face up to this thing and get onto this thing. Many things began to develop and happen there and eventually the revelation of Jesus Christ. I'm one of those fellows you tell me twice, I get it right the third time. But if I get a hold of it, and it becomes a part of me, there won't be too much that will be able to pull it out of me because it becomes to be a part and it's fused to my spirit and I work on that thing and work on it, work on it, and work on it. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save the people from their sins. I'm a young Christian, saved three weeks. And I'd just been talking, uh, discussing about this flying sword because this was a deal I was in. I was never into the physical ships. By the way, the governments of the world have them, and I believe they are also extraterrestrial. You say, are they from God? No. When Jesus comes back, he's not coming back in a flying saucer. And when angels come and appear, they don't have to have flying saucers or any other thing. I believe that as a side tracker, it was just down here in Mount Rainier in 1948. 1940, 48, 47, that the seven discs appeared and Matthew Arnold went up after them, his little Piper Cub, and was trying to uh, uh, make contact with these uh, discs that were flying on Mount Rainier. That was the current uh, spate of this. And there's been increase and increase. This will continue. And it will increase again. And you watch, when God gets ready to move again, there's going to be an increase of this thing and this field here again. And I was uh, uh, talking that night and I was walking home. It was very late at night. And I had that presence. Have you ever had that presence that somebody's around and they're going to get you? And I thought it was these fellas. <laughs> they were coming to get me. They were going to take me for a ride in more ways than one. They were going to take me uh, whatever. They're going to get me. And there was just a sense like that. And do you know what? I was walking down the middle of this road. There's nobody around. I didn't want to yell out too loud. But I learned as a young Christian of three weeks and I prayed with my teeth shut so I didn't yell too loud. And I just used one word when I prayed. Jesus! 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 I just say, O oh, great and eternal God, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and come down, 
Forgive those things we ought to have done and have not done and forgive those things we ought not to have done and have done. Now I am a miserable, worthy, wretched sinner. And we go on about all that stuff. Hey, when Peter was sinking and going down out there on the sea, Lord, I'm sinking. He said, save me. Some of my most dynamic prayers, and a lot of them aren't dynamic, but some of them are. I tell you, they're short. They're straight to the point, And they come from the cry of the heart. And that's what God listens to. See, whatsoever things you desire, that's where this thing comes from. If praying alone would get the job done, we'd have had it done years ago. Come on, come on. It's the principle of faith. There has to be desire. There has to be the white hot prayer. There has to be that desire to receive and the expression and the cry in times of danger. I've seen it happen so many times. When that cry begins to come, and I say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus wasn't very spiritual or I didn't know if I was going about the right way I didn't know anything about praying or anything get saved my greenhorn know nothing about the Bible but I'm telling you that thing began to dissipate when I was in India in 1975 I was sitting in Bombay India and I was just about to speak and this voice came and spoke to me on the front row of a meeting a little devil you know what he said there's two out there, out there with knives they're sitting out just down the first flight of stairs in the foyer and they're there now with knives are going to kill you. And brother, I tell you, shivers just went straight up. I never was just, just right out of that. And I said, this is ridiculous. Now generally, if you're going to overcome something, you want to overcome fear, do the very thing you fear. And I got up from that seat and I went out there and I went looking for him. <laughs> and I got down there and there was no one there. And I said, you devil, Jesus, 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 Jesus and took the name of Jesus and injected that name of Jesus into that thing and that thing began to dissipate never had any more problem with it I was coming home from a Bible study one night and all of a sudden for no reason at all for no reason the hair went up on the back of my neck like that and there was a presence that was in the car it was so real I stopped the car and turned the light on had a look around there was no one there I said you lion devil Jesus Jesus you see, I learned from a very exper young experience that there's power in the name of Jesus. And I know the name of Jesus is a tremendous name that we love and we adore and worship and respect. But it is also an offensive weapon, an attack weapon. In my name, you shall cast out devils. In my name, you'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. In my name, they'll speak with new tongues. That's what you call authority. And I believe that, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and earth and every man that's ever lived, every woman, every boy, is going to bow the knee to Jesus Christ, to the glory of God. And believe that. In my name he'll cast out devils. Where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. How did this man get healed? Through faith in his name. Faith in the name of Jesus. Acts 3. Remember the man that was sitting outside the gate beautiful? He was a cripple. He was asking for arms. Should have been asking for legs. But anyway, there he was. He was outside there and he was asking and lifted up. And when he perceived Peter and John that the man had faith to be healed, he reached out and took him by the hands and lifted him up and his ankle bones received strength and he shouted the praise and glory to God. They said, how did you do that? Don't think that we could do this. That it was faith in his name. I say the name of Jesus is a very, very powerful weapon. If you ever get into trouble and danger and where the sin comes, just call on the name of the Lord. For it shall come to pass in the last days that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Sozo shall be preserved, shall be protected, shall be healed, shall be made whole, shall be in all these connotations of that tremendous Greek word. Sozo shall be preserved. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. He has been given a name. You ever had Bob Larson up here? You know Bob Larson from Denver, Colorado? Rock music, tremendous on music and the power and influence of music. Tremendous. He wrote a chorus that comes right from this verse. He has been given a name, Philippians 2, 9 and 10, that is above every name and in that wonderful name every knee will have to bow. Demons and angels above all must acknowledge his love. And in that wonderful name, you can have an answer now. Jesus, the wonderful Savior. Jesus, the Lamb that was slain. Jesus, my blessed Redeemer. 
Jesus is coming again. Oh, there's something about the name of Jesus. And I heard you shouting it in here tonight. Boy, that's good. I like the name of Jesus. And he's a wonderful, wonderful person. He's been given a more excellent name. Now, if you ever have to go on defense, you say, well, is the name of the Lord a defense? Yes, it is also. Proverbs 18 and verse 10. The name, the name of the Lord. You know that one? Is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it in a safe. And if you have to go on defense and you want somewhere to hide, hide in the name of Jesus. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Get inside that thing, lock the door, and then send Jesus to the door. <laughs> That thing's bigger than you are. That's what the little girl said. She was only three years old. She said, how is it that you just have the victory, little girl? She said, well, every time the devil comes and knocks at my door, I just send Jesus to the door. <laughs> she learned that lesson very, very young. I tell you, they're cute. You listen to kids, a lot of wisdom comes out. The mouths of babes and sucklings. Observation. You watch, open your ears and start to listen. You'll learn a lot of things. And then his name, and if you've been wounded in battle, the name of Jesus is also therapeutic. That means it has healing qualities. Song of Solomon 1.3, his name is as ointment poured forth. Jesus, Jesus, his name is as ointment poured forth. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit. I believe the anointing, the Holy Spirit, is a tremendous offense weapon. The Holy Spirit will teach us all things. Uh, in Exodus 37, we talk about the anointing oil. Isaiah 10 and verse 27. The Bible says the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. The anointing. It reminds me of the man that rode his egg to church. He said, rode his what? Rode his egg to church. He couldn't get it to go and he pulled out the yoke and it went all white. <laughs> I know, that's a bad one. I felt bad about it myself too bad. <laughs> Not by might, nor by power. Zechariah 4, 6. You ever heard that one? But by my spirit, saith the Lord, the anointing and the quickening of God's Holy Ghost is certainly a tremendous offensive weapon. Isaiah 59, 19. When the enemy comes in like a flood, not if. Ooh, you think he might? There's no doubt about it. That's a foregone conclusion. When? It's not a question if. It's a question when. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall raise up a standard. Against. Believe God. Believe God for the anointing. The first message that Jesus ever preached, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the broken heart, to set at liberty them that are bruised, recovering of sight to the blind, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. No wonder the eyes were glued upon him. Never heard a man preach like that. They all read the book. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. But here, boy, this Jesus got up in that pulpit and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Oh, I tell you, when he said that, and you could tell there's something different about this meeting. It's alive. Because the quickening from Isaiah 60, see, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's speaking those words. First sermon he ever preached. If you call it a sermon, I prefer to call him a message. Because that comes, supposed to come from the heart of God and a sermon with all our theories and um, great wonderful words. <laughs> but you see, if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, there's another good verse too about the Spirit of God. I heard somebody saying about the kingdom of God is within me. Uh, here's the same thing. If I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then no doubt the kingdom of God has come unto you. That's a demonstration of the kingdom of God. John the Baptist was in prison. He had doubts if Jesus was the Messiah. You ever heard of that? Have you ever had doubts since you saved? Come on, friend, it's an attack against the enemy, against the minds. I say to people, I say, I don't believe, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in this baptism, I don't believe in the devil. I said, you get filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'll guarantee within eight hours, before you wake up tomorrow morning, you go home, you're going to know there's a devil. You'll have a personal visitation, not from the devil, but from one of his little imps. Makes you wonder, I just talked in tongues myself. Of course you talked in tongues. You that talks in tongues, the Holy Spirit gives the utterance. They brought a woman to me one night, they prayed for her for 18 years to get filled with the Holy Ghost. By the time I gave her my counsel, she was too scared not to talk in tongues. <laughs> oh, I worry them through, scare them through, get them through somehow. Bring the toughies here. 
<laughs> I prayed for a boy down in Calgary in some church. I don't even know what you, Pastor Norm Worth's church. Doesn't matter anyway, you probably know. But, but here and prayed for this guy. And I said, now look here, son. When I pray for you, the Holy Ghost is not going to come from Mars or the sun or uh, 25 galaxies away. But it's going to come. The Holy Spirit is upon me. And when I pray for you, something's going to happen. It's going to come from me to you. And you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. Like that. Put my hands on him. He said, ooh, ooh, ooh. He said, it's like electricity going all through him. He didn't talk in tongues. He said, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> and then away he went. Rumba, cut a seat about it. Just like that. Oh, brother. Look at this. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? The anointing of God binding the strong man. You shall receive one. Do you know that word? The Greek word there is dunamis, from which we get our word? Dynamite. Dynamic dynamo. Ooh, that electric motor. Third of a horse that'll burn this thing in the five horse. Burn this thing up and give you the dynamo and the life, that anointing and quickening that is necessary. Fourthly, the blood of Jesus. How many believe the blood of Jesus to be a tremendous offensive weapon? Revelation 12, 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony. We talk about the blood of the lamb. I talked extensively about fellowship this afternoon. Hebrews 10, 25. Forsake not the assembling that should be of, the, of yourselves together. Fellowship, very important principle, and that is an offensive weapon. When we get together, there's a building up and a recharging when we get together in fellowship and we encourage one another. Pray and fasting. The fasting chapter in the Bible is Isaiah 58. And Jesus said in Luke 18 and verse 1, Men ought always to pray and not throw in the towel. Men are always to pray and not quit because a quitter never wins and a winner never quits. Men are always to pray and not faint. Don't quit, don't give up, don't say there's no hope, there's no point. Men are always to pray. James 5, 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. You know that verse so well. Makes tremendous power available. Seven, knowing who you are in Christ. I believe that to be a tremendous uh, offensive weapon. Knowing who you are. Did you know when Jesus died on the cross, you died with him? Yeah. When Jesus was buried, you were buried with him. When Jesus was ascended from the dead, you were ascended with him. And then he sat down on the right hand of the throne on the majesty of high, legally, and according to the law courts of the universe, you sat down with him. That's where the authority comes from. Maybe we call sheep. It's very easy to pull the wool over our eyes. But I think we want to get a crew cut or get, a, get it short back and sides or get something up there that we can begin to see. And don't let the devil pull the wool over our eyes. But begin to see who we are in Christ. Giving. Don't give of necessity. For God loves an hilarious giver. <laughs> God loves an hilarious giver. Laugh. He said, I just give till it hurts. Keep going, it'll stop hurting soon. Just keep going and, and hang in there. Look at this here. Eh? Don't give of necessity. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Given it shall be given to you. Giving is the nature of God. <laughs> <laughs>